All right, I might as well just record our conversation because we already have Alex. <laughs> but uh, how many of us have actually uh, uh, did some advanced? We're gonna uh, still read it today, but how many of us have uh, gone through some advanced reading for Hebrews 7, 8, and 9? Okay. Uh, all right, uh, just, just a few things that I wanted to clarify. I, I know when, when I read this, uh, the way Alex was presenting it, I said, okay, that's, you know, that, that's something definitely that, that was the gist of what seven and eight and nine were. But uh, a, a lot of what I read, I just goes over my head. I didn't know who Mel Melchizedek was. I didn't know what all that was. Uh, what was the Hebrew writer saying? Uh, so I had to actually go back and read uh, Hebrews one again and all the way to seven, eight and nine. And uh, there are several things, actually there's one thing that I didn't notice uh, that was, uh, that I didn't notice before. Most of the, the explanation or the arguments of the Hebrew writer was on, on, on account of Moses and the law and, and how the law came to be. He was not arguing, he or she was not arguing or convincing the readers about David. David was never mentioned, you know, and they said when the Messiah was going to come from the line of Judah, from the line of David, uh, the stump of Jesse, um, they didn't even, it, it wasn't even mentioned to that fact that, oh, you, you, you got to prove uh, that, he, that Jesus is from the line of David. Th this was more of uh, comparing Jesus and what he did and who Jesus was as compared to Moses and what the law represented to the Jewish people. Uh, when I was explaining this thing to another brother uh, about Melchizedek, he says, so how is Melchizedek important to us? And it made me think, you know, he isn't. Uh, to us, as, as people outside of the, uh, the Jewish people, it, it doesn't really matter to us. That's why when, when I read it, 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 wouldn't, it doesn't strike a chord, you know. But I, I'm going to read something. I'm going to just show something that I learned. Um, you know, th this is an issue of the old and new way, right? Uh, and, and what, uh, what uh, the Hebrew writer was talking about, the, the old way is obsolete, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, and, and then it talks about Melchizedek. Now, Melchizedek, he, he said, uh, what was confusing for me was this script. Uh, the name Melchizedek means king of justice. The king of Salem means king of peace. Uh, there is no record of his father or mother or any of his ancestors, no beginning or end to his life. He remains a priest forever, resembling the son of God. Uh, the, the idea was when we look at the scripture and we say, oh, he, does, he doesn't have a beginning and an end. When we read it as modern people, we, we kind of um, make the assumption, oh, that you know, Melchizedek is immortal because he didn't have an ending or beginning. Um, what, what I was reading, what this actually meant is that there was no record of his genealogy uh, in, in, on, on record. So it, nobody knew who his parents were. Nobody knew what tribe he was from. Uh, as what Alex says, some people even say he's from the, from the land of Canaan. Um, but he was, saying he was resembling the son of God. Oh, Sorry, so noisy. So he, said he was resembling the Son of God. Uh, what this meant was that the Israelite priesthood, uh, most of them, if not all of them, came from the line of the Levites. Melchizedek was a priest of the Most High, which means he was a priest that recognized Yahweh as the Most High God. But he had no Levitical ancestry. He didn't come from the tribe of Levi. In fact, there was no, Levi wasn't even born yet. But Abraham uh, presented tithes to him. He honored him uh, as a high priest of the Most High. Then Jesus was in the line of David, but he is still uh, the high priest like Melchizedek. So meaning Jesus did not come from the line of Levi, but he is still our high priest. He is not from the line of Aaron, you know, but uh, it was 
he was stating that he is still our high, our meaning the, the Jewish people. He was still our high priest in the order of Melchizedek in the same way that Abraham gave honor to him even before he was in the, even before there ever existed a Levite priesthood. Okay. Um, so is it necessary for us to know who Melchizedek is? Short answer is no. Okay. The only point the writer talks about is that Jesus is like in terms of him being non-Levite and non ironic and, uh, uh, and him being more than uh, uh, that, that he, he stands outside the heritage of, of Israel, meaning he was there even from before. And that's why even Abraham paid honor to him. Uh, it was even saying that it, it might, you might actually even say that Levite paid honor to Melchizedek uh, because Abraham paid honor to him. So what the, uh, what the Hebrew writer is saying, in this way, Jesus is like him in his order because uh, he was not in that order of Levites. But we still, the Jewish people would still need to honor him because he's, his line of priesthood or his order of priesthood is more to the line of Melchizedek. That's, that's the whole idea. I know it's very theological when you, when you think about it. I just thought it was very interesting when I read it, um, because I, I could never understand. Some, some people gave this assumption that Melchizedek was actually Jesus, because that's what it said. And it says, uh, but what the Hebrew writer is just trying to say, because they were trying to question, how is Jesus the high priest? How is Jesus able to offer sacrifice for us if he's the Messiah, and the Messiah and the high priest are two different things to them? That's why there's a conflict. That's why there's an argument about who Jesus was as a high priest, because they could not put that two together. If he's the Messiah, he was supposed to lead Israel, but he could not be the high priest. And the Hebrew writer is saying he is the high priest in this order. Okay, so I just want to clarify that because I feel like that's that's a lot not a lot of common misunderstanding for for what that was. So Jesus, from what we've studied, Jesus is more than Moses. Jesus is far more superior than the law. He is far more superior than any systemic or sacrificial or cultic practice the Jewish ever did, uh, the Jewish people ever did. Um, but he is our high priest that ushered in the new covenant. Um, the other thing and final thing that I want to talk about when you say, oh, the, the old is obsolete, so I don't need to read the Old Testament. I don't need to appreciate the Old Testament. The New Testament is what counts. I would say yes if you are the audience here in the, in the book of Hebrews, meaning the book, the, he, the audience in the book of Hebrews are people who know the Old Testament already. And they understand that well, who Jesus is as, as far as prophetic messages, as far as the, uh, who he's supposed to be, as far as ancestry, as far as all this, they, they can put the, all the cryptic prophecies together and, and finally come to that conclusion he is our, uh, say, he is our Savior, He is our Messiah, He is our Lord, based on what they know already. Now, it doesn't mean that we need to do the Old Testament. It's just to make sure that we understand that the Old Testament is not obsolete to the point to the point where you don't need to understand it. Okay, we need to understand how who God was back then, what the plan was from the very beginning, and see Jesus in that plan and appreciate the fact that Jesus is still that plan today. So uh, I, 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 I have this, uh, uh, this thing when, when people say, oh, we're part of the new covenant. You can be part of the new covenant if you don't have an inkling and understanding what the old, old covenant is really all about. Uh, but then again, that's a different story. That's a different uh, a message altogether. Um, I'm just saying to the people who refuse to read anything uh, other than even reading the Old Testament can be sorely misunderstood by just saying, oh, we, uh, you, you, you can't uh, curse, you can't, uh, uh, get, you can't tell a lie, you can't all this. That's all true as far as morality is concerned. But the Ten Commandments was not talking about a simple lie that you said, oh, I didn't do that. Okay, uh, it, it's talking about something way more as, as a nation, how a nation should progress. So that's, again, a different topic altogether. But I just want to bring these two topics up about, uh, about what we read in 7, 8, 9, because it kind of 
it, it kind of melds together. And uh, well, sometimes when we take that one scripture and we focus on it, and somehow that it all kind of messes up the way we think about it. All right. So that's, sorry, this is a different one. All right. So, so thank you, Rich. All right. So we, we'll go on with the with reading. Uh, let me open up my. Yeah. Okay, we'll take turns. Yeah, uh, three verses. I think this one I can share. Can you guys read this? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So uh, let's just go in order of uh, Sean, Rita, Barry, Mark, Ivan, and then me. We'll go with three verses each. The priestly family of Melchizedek. Melchizedek was both king of Salem and priest of God Most High. He was the one who went out and gave Abraham his blessing when Abraham returned from killing the kings. Then Abraham gave him a tenth of everything he had. The meaning of the name Melchizedek is king of justice, but since Salem means peace, he is also king of peace. We are not told that he had a father or mother or ancestors or beginning or end. He is like the son of God, and will be a priest forever. Mm, okay. Are you using and uh, what what version? Oh wait, sorry, out? sorry. Let, let me change the oh. version. I was using this for a different purpose. NLT, right? Yeah. Okay. All right. <clears throat> Number four, uh, uh, verse four. Yeah. Consider then how great this Melchizedek was. Even Abraham, the great patriarch of Israel, recognized this by giving him a tenth of what he had taken in battle. Now, the law of Moses required that the priests, who are descendants of Levi, must collect a tithe from the rest of the people of Israel, who are also descendants of Abraham. But Melchizedek, who was not a descendant of Levi, collected a tenth of Abraham, and Melchizedek placed a blessing upon Abraham, the one who had already received the promises of God. Okay. And without question, the person who has the power to give a blessing is greater than the one who is blessed. The priests who collect tithes are men who die. So Melchizedek is greater than they are because we are told that he lives on. In addition, we might even say that these Levites, the ones who collect the tithe, paid a tithe to Melchizedek when their ancestor Abraham paid a tithe to him. Is it my turn? Yeah. Okay. For although Levi wasn't born yet, the seed from which he was in Abraham's body when Melchizedek collected the tithe from him. So if the priesthood of Levi, on which the law was based, could have achieved the perfection God intended, why did God need to establish a different priesthood with a priest in the order of Melchizedek instead of the order of Levi and Aaron? And if the priesthood is changed, the law must also be changed to permit it. Hey, what? For the... For the priest, we are talking about belongs to a different tribe whose member has have never served at the altar as priest. What I mean is, our Lord came from the tribe of Judah, and Moses never mentioned, mentioned priests coming from that tribe. This change has been made very clear since a, since a different priest who is like Melchizedek has appeared. Jesus became, Jesus became a priest not by meeting the physical requirement of belonging to the tribe of Levi, but by the power of life that cannot be destroyed. And the psalmist pointed out when he prophesied, 
you are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. Uh, uh, yeah. Yes, the old requirement about the priesthood was set aside because it was weak and useless. Uh, Sean? For the Lord never made anything perfect, but now we have confidence in a better hope through which we draw near to God. This new system was established with a solemn oath. Aaron's descendants became priests without such an oath, but there was an oath regarding Jesus. For God said to him, the Lord has taken an oath and will not break his vow. You are a priest forever. Because of this oath, Jesus is the one who guarantees this better covenant with God. There, there were many priests under the old system, for death prevented them from remaining in office. But because Jesus lives forever, his priesthood lasts forever. Therefore, he is able once and forever to save those who come to God through him. He lives forever to intercede with God on their behalf. He is the kind of high priest we need because he is holy and blameless, unstained by sin. He has been set apart from sinners and has been given the highest place of honor in heaven. Unlike those other high priests, he does not need to offer sacrifices every day. They did this for their own sins first and then for the sins of the people. But Jesus did this once for all when he offered himself as the sacrifice for the people's sins. The law brought appointed high priests who were limited by human weakness. But after the law was given, God appointed his son with an oath, and his son has been made the perfect high priest forever. Uh, yeah. Okay, scroll down. Okay, here's the main point. Oh, hold on. Okay, here's the main point. We have a high priest who sat down in a place of honor beside the throne of the majestic God in heaven. There he ministers in the heavenly tabernacle, the true place of worship that was built by the Lord and not by human hands. And since every high priest is required to offer gifts and sacrifice, our high priest must, must make an offering too. If he were here on earth, he would not even be a priest, since there already are priests who offer the gifts required by the law, they serve in a system of worship that is only a copy, a shadow of a real one in heaven. For when Moses was getting ready to build tabernacle, God gave him this warning. Be sure that you make everything according to the pattern I have shown you here on the mountain. Um, but yeah, but now, but now Jesus, our high priest, has been given a ministry that is far superior the old priesthood, for he is the one who mediates for us uh, a far better covenant with God, based on better promises. If the first covenant had been faultless, there would have been no need for a second covenant to replace it. But when God found fault with the people, he said, the day is coming, says the Lord, and I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and Judah. This covenant will not be like the one I made with the ancestors when I took them by the hand and led them out of the land of Egypt. They did not remain faithful to my covenant, so I turned my back on them, says the Lord. But this is the new covenant I will make with the people of Israel on that day, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their minds and I will write them on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. And they will not need to teach their neighbors, nor will they need to teach their relatives, saying, you should know the Lord. For everyone from the least to the greatest will know me already. And I will forgive their wickedness, and I will never again remember their sins. When God speaks of a new uh, covenant, it means he has made the first one obsolete. It is now out of date and will soon disappear. Uh, Hebrew 9, is it? That yeah. first covenant between God and Israel had regulations for worship and a place of worship here on earth. 
There were two rooms in that tabernacle. In the first room were a lampstand, a table, and, a sac and sacred loaves of bread on the table. This room was called the holy place. Then there was a curtain, and behind the curtain was the second room called the most holy place. In that room were a gold incense altar and a wooden chest called the Ark of the Covenant, which was covered with gold on all sides. Inside the Ark were a gold jar containing manna, Aaron's staff that sprouted leaves, and the stone tablets of the covenant. Mark? Mark, are you still there? Did Mark leave? Oh, he's there. Mark, I'm mute. Test. Oh, he's testing. Okay. I'll take over verse, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, is it verse 5, right? Yeah. 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 Five. Above the ark were the cherubim of divine glory, whose wings stretch out over the ark cover, the place of atonement. But we can explain these things in detail now. When these things were, in all, were all in place, the priests regularly entered the first room as they performed their religious duties. But only the high priest ever entered the most holy place, yeah. and only once a year. And he always offered blood for his own sin and for the sin of the people and committed in, in ignorance. Okay. Um, uh, Mark, can you read? Or just let me read. Okay. Uh, by these regulations, the Holy Spirit revealed that the entrance to the most holy place was not freely open uh, as long as a tabernacle in the system it represented was still in use. This is an illustration pointing to the present time. For the gifts and sacrifices that the priests offer are not able to cleanse the conscience of the people who bring them. For that old system deals with only food and drink and various cleansing ceremonies. Physical regulations that were in effect only uh, until a better system uh, could be established. So Christ has now become the high priest over all the good on, things that have. Okay, go ahead. So Christ has now become the high priest over all the good things that have come. He has entered that greater, more perfect tabernacle in heaven, which is not made by human hands and is not part of this created world. With his own blood, not the blood of goats and calves, he entered the most holy place once for all time and secured our redemption forever. Under the old system, the blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer could cleanse people's bodies from ceremonial impurity. Just think how much more the blood of Christ will purify our consciences from sinful deeds so that we can worship the living God. For by the power of the eternal spirit, Christ offered himself to God as a perfect sacrifice for our sins. That is why he is the one who mediates a new covenant between God and people so that all who are called can receive the eternal inheritance God has promised them. For Christ died to set them free from the penalty of the sins they had committed under the, that first covenant. 16, David. Hello. Oh. Now when someone leaves a will, now when someone leaves a will, it is to prove that the person who made it is dead. The will goes into effect only after the person's death. While the person who made it is still alive, the will cannot be put into effect. Thus, the even first covenant was put into effect with the blood of animal. Okay, can you guys hear me? Yeah. yeah. Okay. okay, I'll continue. For after Moses had read each of God's commandment to all the people, he took the blood of cows and goats, along with water, and sprinkled both of the book of God's law and all the people using his branches and scarlet wool. Then he said, this blood confirms the covenant God has made with you. 
Uh, is it one more? Am I supposed to read one more? Yeah. Okay, yeah. sorry. And in the same way, he sprinkled blood on the tabernacle on, and on everything used for worship. Okay. In fact, according to the law of Moses, nearly everything was purified by, with blood. For without shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. That is why the tabernacle and everything in it, which were copies of things in heaven, had to be purified by the blood of animals. But the real thing in heaven had to be purified with far better sacrifice than the blood of animals. For Christ did not enter the holy into a holy place made with human hands, which was only a copy of the true one in heaven. He entered into heaven itself to appear now before God on our behalf. And he did not enter heaven to offer himself again and again, like the high priest here on earth who enters the most holy place year after year with the blood of an animal. If that had been necessary, Christ would have had to die again and again ever since the world began. But now, once for all time, he has appeared at the end of the age to remove sin by his own death as a sacrifice. Uh, let me just close it. And just as uh, and just as each person is destined to die once, after that and after that comes judgment. So also with Christ, uh, so also Christ was offered once for all time as a sacrifice to take away the sins of many people. He will come again, not to deal with our sins, but to bring salvation to all who are eagerly awaiting for Him. All right. So beautiful. Wow. Yeah, so uh, I, I think uh, we, we can take some a little bit more time to reading. Uh, I, okay. Uh, how, is, do you guys have any questions with regards to this thing before we uh, go on reading our own? Uh, do you? Um, yeah. I'll try to answer them. I don't know if I can answer all of them. <laughs> but what, what are some of your questions? Mark, you're saying, yeah, Mark, you're saying it's pretty heavy. Yeah. What, what, yeah. Which part? It, it's quite, um, it, it, um, hmm. Yeah. I felt it's quite, it's, it's, it's not technical, but it's like trying to un, uh, explain the philosophy of the law and how like, you know, it, um, and how Jesus relates. So it's like it's it's answering a lot of questions, I think. But I need to, I I, I definitely want to read it uh, multiple times and like try to digest it one by one. Mm -hmm. Like there's a lot of um, answers to big questions, I guess, or like uh, philosophical questions, I guess, like the law and all that, I, which is very important, right? Because it explains how, how things actually are, and it maybe changes or shapes our perspective of the law like you know I, I like how it closes as well the part where oh no god's not going to deal with our sins but it's actually going to uh you know save us who are waiting for him right so yeah it's, it's beautiful as well yeah. mm. uh, rita did you have any any yeah. comment yeah or yeah I, I, i'm the same uh with mark you know, I'm sort of like, okay, it's, it's a lot to uh, to take in, but um, I don't know. I mean, just thought that I, I would like actually, I mean, I've read it already, uh, I think twice now. Mm -hmm. I mean, when, when Devi said, okay, can you please read it in a sense last week? But still, you know, I just, I don't know. Uh, um, I don't have any uh, favorite verses or I mean, as a uh, like we have to share like a soul but i just i don't know i just i just like to hear other people's point of view in, in this time really because um yeah um i'm i'm sort of like confused about the the first guy well, Kisidek and, and then, you know but then as you said rich that don't you know don't sort of think about that but just think about yeah Think about um, uh, the center point here is Jesus. So, yeah, if if everybody is agreeing, can we just discuss instead of sort of 
you know, pause and then reading our own because, uh, I mean, by talking, I think it's, it's more. Yeah. You know, I can get more info rather than re read again and then sort of like still confused, you know? So, um, I mean, if, if it's okay with the others. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. So, uh, can you tell us more, Rich? And then maybe I can sort of. Uh, okay. Uh Opened, um, yeah. I, I think from what Alex was mentioning that the, the whole plan, all right, okay. I, I'm gonna try to give you cliff notes of what I've studied so far along <laughs> the way. Yeah. Uh, yeah. When, when you read Genesis, when, when you start off with Genesis, it starts off with creation of Eden, right? Uh, yeah. And then uh, when the whole, when, when you read it, uh, it just seems like, oh, God created the world and God created Eden and uh, men messed up and then he, they kept messing up and then under the Tower of Babel, they all dispersed. Uh, mm -hmm. on, the, on, the, on their worldview, on the ancient Near East worldview, uh, and this yeah. was, sorry, I'm, I'm going to get a bit technical. The, the, even in the ancient Near East uh, literature, they would have literature like Gilgamesh the Epic of Gilgamesh, which was somewhat similar to the Tower of Babel uh, and, and, and the Flood. So what happened was when you read Eden, uh, it almost sounds like God was creating a temple story or whoever was writing Genesis. He was talking about a temple story, meaning God created things outside and then created uh, inside, which is Eden, the Holy of Holies where God dwells with people. And then he created the high priest, which was Adam and Eve. So that was the pattern. Okay, when they came out of Egypt, that same pattern was kind of getting rebuilt over in the minds of the Israelites. You see it in the Mount of Sinai, where Moses was the only one to, who was able to talk to, to Yahweh in the top of the mountain. And when, uh, so the, the, he was creating an Edenic or an Eden type uh, environment uh, where God would dwell with people. Then it moved from the Mount Sinai, and it what got replicated to the tabernacle, okay? Which was the again there was a there's a place outside, and then the holy of holies. So there was there was an image that God was communicating to people that I will dwell with you, I will be with you, but there are things that you know that you have done which I can only communicate through uh, certain purification rituals and and, and all that, okay? So, uh, so that came from the tabernacle of tent, and then David wanted to build the temple, which was created by Solomon. Right. So, the whole sacrificial system, and and I'll tell you, and and don't don't uh, struggle with this uh, with this idea. The whole sacrificial system was not new to ancient Near East people. They were doing this way before, even before people were worshiping. What God did, what Yahweh did, was put it in the right perspective. Okay, where the sacrificial system meant something because they were offer sacrifice, they were offering sacrifices to Yahweh. Okay, it it wasn't something new that the Israelites didn't know anything about. They were all uh, sacrificing to different gods before. All right, so when God put it together as, as His. Uh, the tabernacle, the, the holy of holies, God was putting order in something that the people uh, was doing uh, at random. So this became the whole uh, the whole religious sacrificial system of the of the Jewish people. Okay, mm -hmm. so when uh, when the time came that when Jesus, I will I will give you a new covenant which is better than the old, because now uh, that that sacrificial system will happen or, or will take place in the Holy of Holies, which is in heaven, where God actually dwells. And, and then uh, Jesus will be the one to uh, offer uh, as our high priest and offer himself as that sacrifice. So it was no longer because, uh, because Jesus was the high priest, he, he was actually authorized to make that sacrifice of himself and then take away the sins of people. And he was doing it. Uh, he, he was able to enter. Remember, sacrifice first the blood. He died. When he died, he was able to enter the Holy of Holies in heaven. Mm. So that was the whole thing. So when he was able to enter the Holy of Holies in heaven, in a place where man has not made, 
he was able to take away the sins of men that that uh, cursed us to go to uh, to our actual destination, which is hell. Right, and this is where people are arguing in the in the book of Hebrews is that okay, we we know he's the Messiah, we know he's David, we know he's going to lead us uh, out of, out of bondage and all this, but how can he be our high priest? Now the book of Hebrews is explaining this is why he's our high priest. This is why his sacrifice means more than, than what the high priest normally offer. Because he only did it once. And since he was a perfect sacrifice, and he in he sacrificed, when he sacrificed blood and able to enter the Holy of Holies, he was able to create a new covenant because the new covenant can only be done through blood, which is his blood. Okay, so so that that kind of that, that's what I'm saying. When people say, "Oh, we don't need, we don't really need to know the Old Testament," well, that's all Old Testament. <laughs> you know that that's all from the Old Testament in which we can help us understand. Okay, what what did what sacrifice did Jesus do, and why does it make sense? Why does it make sense to the Hebrew people when they saw the sacrifice of Jesus, and under, they understood that his sacrifice actually. Uh, was the ultimate sacrifice that no high priest could ever do. You know, so th that's that's that was the whole essence. So that when you read seven, eight, and nine, in essence, what Pastor Alex was trying to say was what was actually correct. It was giving us an origin story, but but for us to understand the origin story, uh, it has to even go back to okay, how did how did man mess up so badly? That there has to be an old covenant that God had to do it, and how did men mess up the old covenant that there has to be a new covenant? That that kind of how how the story goes. We men has messed up or found so many loopholes in the old covenant that okay, it's not working. Okay, we have uh, the new covenant has to be to take place. Okay, it does not mean that God has forsaken the nation or the people of Israel. It doesn't say that. It just says, okay, the new covenant has to take place. You know, I was I was with uh, a few of my classmates in, in the, my my online class of uh, historical New Matthew. It said uh, there was one Messianic Jew who was there, and he says, you know, be, be uh, he he met somebody who says, if God can't fulfill His promise to the Jewish people, what makes you think He can fulfill the promise to the to the people of the new covenant, and I was like, "Man, that's that's harsh. You <laughs> know, that's that's hard." And then somebody says, "You know, be careful because God did not forget the Jewish people. You know, it's just He's waiting for the Jewish people to come back to Him. You know, as a nation." And uh, I I think you need to. Uh, and he was talking to the Jewish guy. You need to understand you're still part of the process. You know, you just have to realize it. You know, God didn't abandon you for the church. You're still part of that promise. You know, he's just giving you a new way to get to his goal rather than uh, what you always believe it should be. So, so that's, that's, that's my thing on, the, uh, on 7, 8, and 9. Uh, because of that origin story, it, it makes more sense if we put the heart of God that it was it was God's plan from the very beginning to uh, redeem mankind. It's just, it, it could have only happened through Jesus. Uh, that for some reason, you look at history, you look at any given point in time in history, it couldn't have happened anytime before Jesus. And it really couldn't happen anytime after because of what happened in the Romans, what happened in, the, in Babylon, what happened in all this. It was really going to be hard. It was... This was uh, when Jesus was born and crucified, and, and then when the church grew. Um, it was only at this time that more and more records were actually being kept, uh, historical records. So it was really the perfect time for 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 the crucifixion of Jesus to actually happen. If it if it happened like centuries before, people would see it as a myth. You know, but because there were so many people in Jerusalem, Romans, Greeks, and, and all this that were able to spread the news, that was truly the perfect time for him, for that, for for God's plan to actually uh, for, to be fulfilled. So, I mean, 
you know, when people say, oh, God wrote the Bible, he didn't really write it per se, but the events that took place, I believe that was God guiding the whole thing all the way. You know, there were still people who wrote it, but it was God who, and the Spirit who directed all the events. And that's how he's the author of the Bible. Okay, I'm going to stop talking now. <laughs> if I, that's so good, Rich. And I loved how you, how you explained how God always wanted to make his presence known and always wanted to have that relationship and how uh, his presence was, you know, before um, in, in Eden and then Adam and Eve were, had to leave Eden, right? And then it was, uh, and then through Abraham, the covenant and then the tabernacle and then the temple and all that. And I love that. And, you know, when you go back to Hebrews 9, 8 here, how he's, how he's explaining that it's that the, the sacrificial system was just a replica or was really um, where Jesus is seated now in the right hand yeah. side of God. Right. Um, it says there that there was a holy place and it was the most holy place. And then only the Levite priests were able to go in there but i love this in verse 8 where it says by these regulations the holy spirit revealed that the entrance to the most holy place was not freely open as long as the tabernacle and the system it represented were still in use so that just shows that um that uh that most holy place is that when jesus died on the cross it's when the curtain was split right, in half right, exactly and it is in that moment that finally god made a way for us to have access to the father through mm -hmm. jesus and it really goes back and 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 somehow comes full circle there that's why we're always going back to the cross of intersex history and i agree with you rich it's the perfect timing that jesus died and was resurrected it was the perfect timing but you know you go back to creation where adam and where adam and eve had been given everything for a wholesome life and that abundant life that, that and that relationship that they have with God because mm -hmm. we read in Genesis how God will come down and commune and commune with yeah. Adam and even talk to them and all that right but because of the sin they were separated from God and through Jesus because men were separated through Adam's fall and Adam's sin Jesus brought us back into that right relationship with him so now that the temple that the curtain and the temple was put in split in half through Jesus, we can have that direct relationship with God again, as Adam and Eve had before yeah. they sinned. And that is why it's so beautiful. It's always been relationship and God tried throughout history. And he thought, okay, it's going to be the, my, the Jewish people. They're going to be my people. And they're going to show the rest of the world how they can have a relationship with God, but they failed, right? And I think um, that is why this verse it just is just speaks so clearly. The Holy Spirit revealed that the entrance to the most holy place was not freely open as long as the tabernacle and the system it represented were still in use. That that old system had to die. It had to be made obsolete. And that's why Jesus had to yeah. had to build the new covenant. And 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 how incredible it is that we are in living in a time where we're not under that that old covenant anymore that we can have that relationship with god as adam and eve had right through jesus it's so incredible i mean for me that's what stands out and for me honestly that's what's the most important because that relationship is just so real you know and it's so liberating and really in christ we have been giving given everything we need and we have that access where we can come to god at any time anywhere and talk to him through jesus it's incredible so that's just my five cents yeah. adding to what you were saying, um, Rich. Yeah, if, if you guys read Exodus, uh, I, I know we, we studied this with Sean, that when a small, the idea or the vision or the image of God that's rest, that would rest on the ark, uh, even on the mountain, we fire and, and wind, fire and strong wind, right? So that the image of fire and, and strong wind uh, is what they connected with God. Oh, that's, that's the image of God. Now, when you look back in the book of Acts, during the time at Pentecost, what came down on the believers? It was a tongue of fire and there was a strong wind. And where did it land? It landed on the believers. So Ray Vanderland was actually saying, this 
was God changing his address. That instead of coming from the temple, instead of resting on the ark, he now rests. The Holy of Holies on earth is now resting. The ark, where the ark used to be on the Holy of Holies, the image of fire and wind, the image of fire and spirit now rests on the believers. And, uh, and he was saying, this, this is God changing his address because now it's on the hearts of people. And that's what in Jeremiah, the, the, script, the scripture that was quoted, the, the law will be in the hearts of men and, and the minds of, and, and the minds of, of men. It's not going to be put on, on, on these uh, stones. and anyway, It's going to be in, uh, imprinted on the hearts of men. The law will be there on their hearts. So, I mean, this is the, the sign of the new covenant in which Jeremiah was talking about, and he what she was prophesying. Uh, and this is the same thing the Hebrew writer was saying. This is the sign. You know what it is. Um, and and, and uh, unless, and, and I'm telling, and I'm, I want to be honest with you, if you haven't felt that difference in, 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 in your heart, then maybe it's really time to take, to, you know, uh, to take some time down, sit down. Let's let's study the scriptures out. You know, may, maybe we'll find out something that. Okay, how how can I understand that? How can I be more and more? Uh, the the fact that you're here and you're eager, you want to learn. I think that's already says a lot of statements. Uh, that that you want to learn more about Jesus because that that's what it is. It's an eagerness to please God. That's that's the sign of uh, what a believer truly is. You know, it's it's not about whether I go to church every day. It's not whether about, uh, uh, you know, but it's an eagerness in your heart to humbly go and I just want to please God. That that's the, that's the sign that it is for, uh, and that you should move on that sign, because there's also a part of the Hebrews that says, if you if you don't listen to the Spirit, then you're choking the Spirit. You know, you gotta listen to what the Spirit is telling you. So. Anybody else? Rita, you have any? <laughs> Ivan, you, Sean. Thank you. Uh, it, it's more, you know, uh, it's clear to me. Thank you also, <laughs> Dewi. Uh, I mean, then I, I just turned to Hebrew 9 when you were saying, yeah, okay. So it's <laughs> okay. No, I understand. <laughs> Thank you. This is it, you know, this, uh, this is what the, the group is for we can sort of be, you know, uh, be truthful that if I don't understand, I want to ask, yeah, you know? <laughs> I kind of had that feeling that was going to happen when I read this. Okay, this, this is a bit, uh, it has a lot of Old Testament allusions that might need a little bit yeah. more explained. Yeah. Mm. Mark, you okay now? You, you have some... Where is he? Yeah, I'm just using my phone now. Like I'm actually my I'm using this old laptop because the other one's in repair. So I'm just using my phone now. Uh, yeah, I wish we can we can meet up instead of zooming. You know, just now. Yep. Also, that yep, definitely. Oh, Wi-Fi is not good. Uh, you know, here. <laughs> Are you guys all okay to meet up? Because I mean, like. <laughs> We could. It it was be it would be incredible if we could meet up. Yeah. I mean, we have how many more? Two more, yeah. Um, right. Yeah. Uh, Rich with two more sun. Yeah, you're you're gonna. Okay, so maybe next week we can still do Sunday on Zoom, but then the last one, let's meet up. Yeah. Okay. You wanna? Do you wanna uh, meet up physically for the last one? Yeah. I think that would be nice. Thanks. Yeah. I mean, it's, if you're uh, okay with uh, it, the, I mean, Sean is all the way in Yeah, no, I'm just <laughs> a, a question. Um, the the uh, TC, I mean, the Pondok Indah one, the City Bank, it's open every week, right? Every Sunday? No, I think yeah, it, it alternates. Is. It doesn't it alternate? Pick, pick okay, in, I thought so. In, so today is peak, right? Today is peak. Last week was okay. Pondok Indah. Yeah. Well, so if you want, we can also meet next Sunday. If you if it's easier for you to meet in Pondok Inda, we can meet yeah. next Sunday there. In I don't Inda. know, Sean, Ivan, I'm not sure. I mean, I, I, <laughs> I thought that we can go to church and then after that, and then we can have our session, which is, but, I think is... Okay, yeah. Uh, 
I, I'm okay, but what my my thing is, I think the decision we make has to be unanimous agree. If, if yeah, can't, if agree. can't be one yeah, yeah, one person not yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So what was that, Sean? You were saying something? No. Oh, okay. Your mic was off. That's why. Yeah. Is there any other? Uh, uh, you guys have any other questions that we can, I can help with? Well, it's it's um, like our our belief, our um, new covenant with Jesus right now hmm. seems to be very. It's way simpler, and it's like God giving us all the free pass and. Unlike the previous covenants that you have to do this, you have to do that, and you don't you have to do the sacrificial rituals, this yeah. and that, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. And it seems like it's I don't know, I, I well, it yeah, it's just seems one that easy. I come, come to mind. It's it seems too easy, but I mean mm. like, but God doesn't require your work now, right? Your gut requires your faith and your um, obedience. I guess it's the matter of the heart, not the work. I think. What 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 do you think is easier, though? I mean, what what do you? I mean, okay. Let me rephrase that. Uh, look at what happened to Israel over time. I'm pretty sure when the law was presented to them by Moses uh, about the sacrificial system, about what, what they need to do, um, I'm pretty sure they, they all had the right heart, right? When it all started. Oh, this is God, this is our new land. We better make sure that we're, we're, we're doing right before God. Uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure that's what it was. I mean, we don't want to be like those who died in the desert. Uh, but along the way, somehow there was rituals that got involved. So this became a practice. This is what worked. So this is what how it's always going to be. Okay. So keep that in mind. Now keep in mind. Now uh, when we when we went to the book of Acts yesterday, were you there, Ivan? Yeah, you were there. Ivan was there. You were just mm -hmm. quiet. Okay. So. Yeah. When, when we were there, uh, when we were talking about uh, Barnabas going to Antioch, and it was like 13 years uh, for him to actually go from the Pentecost to the church in Antioch, that was about 13 years. And one of the speculation was, you know, uh, because there was a note about there about the circumcision party, about the Judaizers. So you can already tell that there was a pattern that in the beginning of Pentecost, there were all you know, fired up. They were all doing things the right way. They were not, not the right way, but they were doing things with the right heart. You know, everything was okay. Uh, and then Gentiles started coming to, to church. And then they all started, no, no, no. If, if Gentiles are going to come over, then they need to go back to the, to, they need to be circumcised. They need to do all this. You know, the, so they were going back to their ritualistic idea. Okay, and that's why I, I kind of felt oh, this is probably the reason why God started allowing Gentiles. It's to show everybody that it's time to break free from the old. Right? So now when you're saying, okay, it seems like God is making uh, easy for everybody to come to him. Uh, if he doesn't do that, what, how, you know, the, the idea or, or the way people come to him, it's going to be another formulaic uh, with another formula. This is how you come to God. You, you come and you get baptized and after that you, you don't do this, 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 this. Then you will achieve salvation. It will become another Jewish uh, religion. When, when, yeah. when, when right. the Jesus said or when the uh, apostle, apostle said, oh, you need to repent and get baptized. Okay, what it's saying there is that, listen, repentance is on you. There are things you need to change, and only you know what to change. You know, and it will be the spirit moving in your heart. This is what repentance is for me. You know, it's it's, it's not about you don't smoke, don't drink, don't do it. If you feel like that's something you need to repent of, then that's a spirit moving in you for you to repent. Okay, it's not it's not a point 
Oh, and what about baptism? Baptism is a show of 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 bending the knee off or or like surrender. Okay, this yeah, I'm I'm gonna follow God this time. It's a reminder for you that you actually made that decision to follow God. You know, it's it's not showing to people, hey, I'm a follower, because not everybody's gonna know you're a follower outside of the church, right? But it's a reminder for you, hey, I made that decision to follow. So everything now, sure, it's a lot easier without the ritualistic understanding, but it's it's a whole lot more accountability on you, right? You yeah, know maybe it doesn't. Doing. It's not too possible. It's not easier, but it's less ritual. Yeah, I would just say it's simpler, not yeah. easier. Yeah, yeah, simpler. Because it's definitely right. not easier. Yeah. And the second thing, it's um, about Melchizedek, right? Because like Abraham is have been talking to God, like like talking, like he's hearing God's voice, right? Mm. Tell him to do, go here to do that. And this is just my curiosity. What's the purpose that God putting Melchizedek in a person to Abraham and assuming that if God, if Abraham never met Melchizedek before, how does Abraham knows that Melchizedek is the highly priest and of, and there was no Israel back then, right? Okay. It's, that, it's, just, it's just my curiosity. Okay, that, that's a fair question. Here's something that, might, that shocks people when I tell them. Uh, there are other people who recognizes Yahweh as the Most High. It wasn't just Abraham. Okay, so, but it was God who chose Abraham to show people what it's like to be truly under Yahweh's, uh, to, to be truly under Yahweh, you know, to, to follow him, to actually listen to what, uh, to what he wants them to do, right? Uh, in the same way, like, uh, say, the Ethiopian eunuch in the book of Acts, yeah, he he's a follower, uh, Lydia, who is uh, who is a worshiper of God. Uh, you know, it it does or is it Priscilla and Aquila? I'm not sure anymore. But uh, we'll get to that someday. But uh, there were people who said, "Oh, this this person is this so and so is a worshiper of the Most High." Okay, that doesn't mean they were Jewish. It means they recognized who Yahweh was. Right. So uh, Melchizedek was a priest. Because of course, uh, it's not so. Much, you should read the 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 art. No, not the article. The actual story in in the book of Genesis. Uh, because after Abraham uh, defeated all these kings, uh, it was already acknowledged that he met up with Melchizedek, who was the king and the high priest. You know, he was the king of Salem, and he was the king of righteous. So. He was meeting up with some of the kings that gave, you know, that uh, uh, that recognized who Abraham was and what Abraham did, and then Abraham recognized that they were that he was a king and then offered him a tithe. You know, but in this order, uh, other studies as I was saying that Jesus was like Melchizedek because he's a high priest and a king for us. You know, but uh, again, that's not what the Hebrew writer is saying. But uh, if if we really take take to, to, to a logical standpoint how much of Jesus was he like Melchizedek or how much Melchizedek was like Jesus, they had the same position. And they were the king and the high priest. You, you, you get that? So that it's more of a comparison to their position rather than, than more than anything else. That makes sense. And maybe like this is just another one. It's on when the Hebrew writers um, telling about the tabernacle, about the sacrifice, it's it's mentioning that the what is it? Is it the, the two rooms in the temple? It's mm -hmm. a copy what was in heaven. So assuming it's either Holy Spirit telling or the writer has a vision of it, right? 
the the common belief that people have is that whatever is in heaven god replicated on earth that that's that's a common world view uh for them uh that that uh, we are made in god's image here so a, a lot of what's similar uh, not similar physically but a lot of what's similar in heaven is also similar uh, is there if there's a representation of it here uh i don't know what i forgot which scripture it was but according to what i studied that was a world view that was shared by people back then so that's another again that's another topic maybe i can i can look it up and then uh, I explained it some more. Well, the Holy Spirit is always the one who reveals. Yeah. Uh, Ivan, you know, the truth. And so um, I believe it was when when the, the writer was, it was a revelation that the writer had from the Holy Spirit because we believe that everything that is revelation through the Spirit of God, right? That there's nothing that's written in there that is not Holy Spirit inspired by uh, where the writers are not inspired. So definitely Holy Spirit inspired, um, inspiring the writer to write that. And and um, uh, yeah, that's just my my yeah. opinion. You, you, if you, if it could you be through Revelation, Ivan. It yeah. could be through Revelation. It could, like John had, you know, when you right when you read Revelation, that was when you read the book of Revelation. John literally had a revelation from God about about end times, right? So what it's going to be like. So it could have been that that in that moment, the writer of Hebrew was inspired of what that really looked like in the heavenly places. Um, but what exactly we wouldn't know, Ivan. But for sure, it was Holy Spirit inspired the writer. And I. In commandments to love your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and to love your neighbor as you love yourself. And actually, when you we put that into practice, it is so much harder than than just following rules, because to love people really takes. It's not easy when we do it on our own strength, right? We all know that if we're being honest and and also um it says i don't know where it says maybe i um rich you remember but it also says where jesus says all the law all the laws and prophets hang on these two commands yeah. right i don't know if that comes after that but jesus did say the most com most important is to love god and love your neighbor mm -hmm. and all the laws and prophets hang on these two commandments that means like in order to follow the whole law, you have the, the the motivation still has to be love, loving God and loving other people, and that's why they failed because they they couldn't because because it, it took the love of Jesus to die on the cross to show us how much God really loved us for us to be able to receive that love and be saved by that love and rescued by that love and then for us out of that to be in re love relationship with God and be able to love other people it, it, it needed to be uh, Jesus needed to be that sacrifice of love you know to end the system uh, to make the system obsolete but also to usher us into this new covenant of love where we can go back to having that relationship with God like Adam and Eve had in the garden you know so it seems more sim simple when you read the new, when when we read the commands in the new covenant that way of love but it's so much harder and that's why we were given the holy spirit you, you know when you read the 10 commandments over and over uh you can tell that jesus was just summarizing the 10 commandments about loving god i mean you, you think about the idea of you shall not have any other gods before me Okay, you should honor the Sabbath. I mean, you should have a sacred time uh, with God. Uh, you should not have any idols made of anything that would in, that would change your uh, worship for me. I mean, that's all love for God. 
<laughs> that's all, right? And, and then the others where you honor your father and mother, you should not bear false witness, do not covet, do not steal. That's all loving your neighbor. All right, so if, if people back then just realized, oh, that's what it is. That, and the Jesus, what Jesus was stating was just like, listen, this is, this is the whole uh, uh, commandments of the prophets and, 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 uh, and Moses. Okay, that's, that's, that's where it all hangs, loving God and loving people. It's not a new commandment. It's just when you come to really think about it, that's all the commandments. You know, what, what the new commandment Jesus gave, there was, a, there was a new commandment. The new commandment he gave was, uh, and he went to his disciples, a new command I give you, to love one another as I have loved you. Okay, that's the new commandment. That, that, that the standard of love that we should have for people is now God's standard. You know, not, not the standard of man, not all this. It has to be when Jesus said, love people the way I love you. And then you need to have, you need to put him in mind on when you're doing that. When you're under, when you're trying to ask that question, how am I going to love this person? How would Jesus love this person? You know, I, I know it's, it's a lot harder when, you, when you're trying to love somebody that's really unlovable when they're hurting you already, like when they're punching you in the face, you know, that's, that's a little bit harder to, to swallow, but it says, you know, uh, we don't have to take it all that, that far when Jesus love, you know, love one another. He said, love people around this, talk to the disciples, love one another, the people around this room, love each other the way I love you. Okay. He's not talking about strangers. He's talking about people that you do know. And then when you do know somebody, when you do meet somebody, love him like the way Jesus does. Okay? He's not talking about you sacrificing for somebody who just robbed you in the streets. Okay? He, he does say love one another, people that you do know, right? The way I love you. That, that makes it a lot easier to uh, imagine or digest or even obey, actually. All right, guys. It's four. It's four p.m. <laughs> I guess it's it's time. Sorry for speaking too much. <laughs> no, we always learn a lot from you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. I really um, no. I am sort of like um, more understand about everything. Thank you, Dewi. Thank you, Rich. And um, yeah. I like the uh, chapter nine. I think that's really, yeah. yeah. Now, when I think about it, okay, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, thank you so much. Amen. So, yeah. Oh, well, why, why don't we close in a word of prayer? Uh, uh, Devi, can you still close us out? Yeah, I can. Let's pray. So, Father, thank you that you are a God that is just, so understanding and so loving and that you are just so open for us to be able to reason with you and question things and ask things and that you gave us a mind so that we can ruminate on your on on, on your word lord and treat, uh, really uh, rely on your holy spirit to help understand what you're trying to uh, speak into our hearts but just thank you that that we can uh, have a group like this where we can discuss deeper issues and where we can um, be honest about our struggles and the questions we have and um, just pray that you would continue to reveal yourself to each one of us of who you are and how much you love us and that we would really grow in understanding um, more about the new way of life you've called us to Jesus in this new covenant of just really loving living in a loving relationship with you and the father and in, in, in intimacy with your Holy Spirit and, and, and out of that relationship to love others well and to serve people in humility and in love, Lord. And so I just pray that you make that a greater reality in each one of our lives, Lord. Um, continue to speak to us and reveal yourself to us, Lord, in a personal way where we will get to know you more and more, Lord, and just be just left with so much more awe and wonder of who you are and your great love for us. It's just 
speak also your your blessing and favor upon everybody upon sean lord i pray you give him a great week he'll be better than the last week lord um pray for rich lord that you bless his time in punchak with his family we pray for rita lord that you just continue the love on her lord and her family lord and that she will be at peace knowing that you you love her family so much more than she ever could lord and pray also for ivan lord that you continue to reveal yourself to him in a way that he will really grow in deep friendship and relationship with you and pray for mark as well lord that you um would continue to cultivate a hunger in him to know you more and to grow in relationship with you thank you lord for our friendship that we're family in you jesus um we love you and we thank you for this time and we thank you for your word in jesus name amen amen amen, amen. thanks rich thanks to Bye, guys. See Thank you, everybody. Bye. Love you all. Bye. 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 Bye.